Hello and welcome to the Bulletproof Marketer, everybody. Huh. How is everybody out there doing today? It's been an absolutely crazy week, so I hope everybody out there is ready for a nice relaxing weekend. But not just yet, we have a packed show that you have to listen to, right? Of course, because I cultivated it all for you. It's been curated with my own little hands. Total lie, it's been done by my team. But my team knows exactly what you're looking for and so do I. So I've cherry picked some of the most interesting stories and kind of the most eye-catching stories that I saw over the last few weeks. And we're gonna talk about that in the trend spotter segment that's gonna be coming up immediately following uh, this part of our show. And then also we're going to be have two fantastic guests today. I'll tell you more about them in just a little bit. And we have our Stockholm Syndrome, which we might be talking about video. You know, don't want to leak it out too much. And then we also have the Silver Bullet, which is one great marketing thing that you should be trying and kind of incorporating into your campaign. And then we'll kind of just do a really quick wrap up. So it's going to be a pretty fast paced show. So I want to just jump in. Is this the first time you've been listening? Raise your hands. Obviously, I can't see your hands, right? It's a, um, a, this is audio but I'm feeling your hands. Welcome, welcome. I, as I go through and, and like good game, everybody, like it's just a, like a little league baseball game that's been over. Um, but welcome so much to the show. This is the Bulletproof Marketer where I, your host, Christopher Tompkins, will offer no BS marketing advice, no BS here. This is all um, BS free, if you want to see, if you want to say that. Um, basically, I've got a little bit tired of all uh, constantly seeing all the late breaking things that I as a, a digital marketer need to be paying attention to. And I think that's about enough. Let's give you the stuff that is the cream of the crop, the best of the best, so that you can create campaigns that make differences as opposed to campaigns that just spin their wheels, which is what a lot of the late breaking news will have you do. Also make you a little bit frightened and scared, like you feel like you're behind. So. If you want to learn more or get more engaged all with the show, the Bulletproof Marketer has a companion newsletter. <laughs> Ta-da! All you have to do to sign up is go to gosalesandmarketing.com. That's gosalesandmarketing.com. And you can sign up. There'll be a pop-up there. I'll smack you right in the face um, if you miss it. I, I'm, I'm not being aggressive enough with my pop-up, so I'm sorry but it's very aggressive and it's, it's for you. So you can, you can sign up very easily. You don't have to look for anything. Go to gosalesandmarketing.com and just sign up right there. Then you'll get um, our daily emails um, every single day, which are the cream of the crop in terms of the late breaking digital marketing news. So there's gonna be some great things there that you can apply immediately to your life as well as this show, which is an extension of that, which is where I will choose the stories, which I think are ones that you really need to pay attention to the most and kind of bring them to the forefront and just give you my take on them. So again, if you want to go to gosalesandmarketing.com, you can sign up for the newsletter. There's lots of great information there as well. If you want to click around, we have a, um, a blog and lots of other great stuff. So without further ado, let's jump into, oh, let me tell you, I forgot. I can't forget about my guests. My God, they're so good today. Um, so we have some two fantastic guests. The first one we have coming up a little bit later in the show is going to be Brian Clayton, who is from GreenPal. He has a really interesting story. He's going to tell us about how he made that transition from being a blue collar entrepreneur to a tech entrepreneur, which is a big freaking jump, right? I mean, going from one category to another is, is very challenging, especially if you're going into tech from not having lots of experience in it. Um, his journey is really fascinating. So I wanted to bring his story to you guys and gals out there. And also um, he is going to touch on some local SEO topics, which is really fantastic. But his story really is the meat and the potatoes that I wanna bring you. Then we have my friend, Harry Morton, who's from Lower Street. Harry's phenomenal because he, his company Lower Street is all about podcasting and leveling up your podcasts. Um, and I, so you've, you've been sending in lots of questions uh, since we've had our previous podcasting guests on. So Harry's going to go th run through those and give you the answers that you want. So listen in if you want to learn more about podcasting, which you should, because it's a big deal. Social audio, next big thing. You heard it here first, folks. Actually, you probably didn't hear it first. You hear it first. It's been everywhere. But if you want to believe that, go for it. Um, I'll take the credit for it. So without further ado, now let's go into the BPM trend spotter. 
So this is where we're going to cover the most interesting news and trends that have developed over the past week. And of course, I'm going to give my spin on them. So I've been watching our newsletter for the last week and just the, the last recent days. And I have come up with some stories that I really do want to dive directly into to kind of uh, give you a little bit more of my take on them. So the first one I want to talk about is a TikTok. Okay, yes, 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 I know. We talk about TikTok a lot on the show. And the reason being is that there's a lot to say about it. I'm sorry. I mean, I wish I didn't have to talk about TikTok every day of my life. I, I really do. I like other things too. I like variety is the spice of life, right? Um, but TikTok is definitely something that has been um, uh, at the top five of the conversations that I've been having over the past few months internally um, with team as well as externally with clients and prospects as well. So what's the latest, huh? What's the latest thing? Okay, this is something that I, I kind of touched on, I believe on another, uh, another episode, which was TikTok extending the length of the actual TikToks themselves. So what we have here is we have TikTok, this is from um, NBC News, um, has this story, and it's TikTok will now let users post videos of up to 10 minutes long. So they've increased the maximum video time in July. So TikTok last, sorry, last increased its maximum video time in July when it upped the length from the one minute to three minutes. So now they're going to allow users to create videos up to 10 minutes long. So what does that say about how you will utilize TikTok? <laughs> Come on, how are you utilizing it now? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, if you're out there and you're utilizing TikTok and you're, and you're doing gangbusters, that's fantastic, awesome. You are in the minority of probably the people that are listening to this right now. Um, a lot of people are still trying to get together their video plan, I guess you can call it. Um, are we going to be hiring people? Are we gonna be casting actors? What are we gonna do with the script? Do we have to write a script? Who's filming it? Do they film it? Do I film it? What do I do? A lot of people are scrambling for that. This is good for new creators, I think, um, meaning brands like, like you who are listening today that haven't even thought about using TikTok because you can start playing with longer content and then find out how you can cut that longer content down to that short content. Because sometimes within, within, your, within your, your marketing department, and also the marketing department has to create the videos for you, right? Based off of whatever, whatever is going to be best for the company. And sometimes the brass in the company or the C-suite leaders are a little bit more verbose about what needs to be said um, in terms of videos and blurbs and whatever. So for example, if you've ever had to tell um, your boss or the CEO or someone that is looking after your social media posts that, hey, I, I really love what you said here, but Twitter is only X amount of characters. Or yeah, you know, that's fantastic, but I can't put links on this Instagram post. Here is a chance for video because they can be verbose up to 10 minutes and still get involved on TikTok, but you can then cut it down to shorter videos. Now, do I think that this is ideal? I don't, I don't really see um, it as being ideal right now, um, but I do see the future of it. And I do see that it, it going live and doing lives on TikTok. I think there's, there's, it's going to start um, evolving as as everything else does, you know, uh, but in, in the short term, I think it creates a good opportunity for people that don't understand how to create short video to create something to get on TikTok and just try to get their toehold into that ladder to start climbing. So uh, what do I think about the 10 minute videos? Eh, eh, meh. It, I think about it the same way I think about um, the uh, long Twitter posts. Twitter is supposed to be short. I think it's most effective when it's short. When when people go on and on and on in Twitter, I, I'm bored. So I kind of feel like it's similar to um, TikTok, but that is my opinion. That may not be the opinion of the masses as things roll out. Remember, I'm a marketer just like you. I'm seeing all this stuff on a daily basis. So I judge it a little bit more harshly than possibly the public would, even though the public likes to judge things pretty harshly. So let's let's mosey our asses over to LinkedIn um, because LinkedIn has something that I thought was when I read this story I was like oh this could be very good and very positive I'm hoping it's going to give me the metrics that I want um, Media Post um, is um, reporting that LinkedIn is going to acquire Aribi. 
um, and plans to open an office in Tel Aviv. Now, Aribi is a marketing analytics company that's based in Israel. Israel is really big news, folks. Um, I've seen lots and lots of movement and growth within that country, which is phenomenal. Um, and uh, I've actually seen a lot of their businesses grow into having um, American counterparts um, and offices in America. So definitely it's a, it's a country to watch, uh, especially for expansion. They have some really fantastic tech stuff going over there. So that's gonna be probably coming our way very soon, which would be phenomenal if it isn't already here now. But Aribi would be great because it is a marketing analytics company. What they wanna do is they want, LinkedIn is acquiring it because they want to give the people that are utilizing the users of LinkedIn more information. Now, one of the biggest piece uh, and more analytical information, just to make that very clear, one of the biggest problems with LinkedIn that I have, I love it down to the ground. There's so many different things that you can do with it. It's a very versatile platform, but reporting is lame-o, lame-o. So if I'm trying to find any sort of trends, the information that it provides is very limiting. So with the, the acquiring of Aribi, there is a, there's a definite possibility that we're going to be able to get more metrics. So for example, if you're pulling a report on Facebook versus TikTok versus Instagram versus YouTube versus LinkedIn, you will see LinkedIn offers 20% to 10% of the metrics that are available in all of those other platforms on its own, right? On their own, um, not combined. LinkedIn just really does not give you a lot of oomph. So making decisions can be a little challenging to be quite frank, but you can, you know, you have to do more digging in order to find, to find those. But based off of numbers, you have to do digging. You can't just show what they've given you because it's not enough. Hopefully folks, this acquirement of Aribi is going to change it and give us a little bit, our marketers out there, a little bit, a little bit more to sink our teeth into and something that's going to help us um, market smarter. Also, there's advertising implications for this. There's targeting implications. There's lots of really fantastic things. So I'd be interesting to see what this, where this goes. I'm glad that LinkedIn's finally waking up to this fact. Um, so I'm excited. So for marketers, this is definitely a plus. When will this roll out? Don't ask me. I don't. I didn't acquire a Rebe. LinkedIn will know. Um, fall would be my guess on that one, if not um, 2023. So one more story to kind of get things <laughs> exciting um, from uh, Instagram itself. Uh, basically, what they are saying is, let's kind of get rid of IGTV and focus on Reels. So that's what it looks like it's going to do. Um, so I think that what's going to, what's going to happen um, because of the focus on Reels, um, IGTV ads are going to be taken out. Um, also, there's not going to be any more support for IGTV in terms of the app. So what that means is that Reels is the be all and end all. Unfortunately, if you struggle with doing short form video content, this is not going to be the, the best news for you, right? If you're really relying on IGTV to get out your long story, but I don't think a lot of people are, to be honest, and that's why they're focusing on the Reels platform. So they're really putting a lot of their weight behind that and then just kind of abandoning IGTV. So if, if that is a prime cornerstone of your marketing strategy, which my guess is that it's not, it's probably something you might do from time to time, understand that that's going away. But I mentioned earlier that TikTok is increasing its long form content up to 10 minutes. So possibly that IGTV content that you used to have could be more valuable on TikTok. Ooh, there's a, there's a solution right there. Is it like a seamless solution? No, because maybe your TikTok narrative is different than your Instagram one. But uh, yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do? You know what I mean? This is, this is one of those things where the, the platform is evolving and it's telling you what's most important and IGTV is not one of them. I personally don't feel like it was one of the most, um, the stickiest thing in the world. I didn't really feel like it really delivered as much as it had promised. And I do feel like Reels is much more, um, a much more sound investment. So 
there you go. So basically, TikTok's going to be longer, IGTV is going to go away, um, and LinkedIn's going to be providing possibly some metrics that could help you make um, level up your LinkedIn game, which would be awesome. So, so not too bad, right? It's it's across the board, not not too uh, too negative news. Everything seems pretty damn positive this time around. So let's keep that positivity train going. Um, and after the break, I'm going to welcome our guest. Our first guest, Brian Clayton, who's going to be talking about how he went on his journey from blue collar entrepreneur to a tech entrepreneur and kind of what, what's going on with him right now. So learn more about Brian after the break. See you in a minute. Hey, parents, are you looking to make it easy to promote your child's development? Well, I want to introduce my go-to, which is Motor Planet. Motor Planet is a powerful developmental program designed to enhance your child's skills. Their software-based program offers fun, motivating activities designed to challenge your child's abilities. So we're talking fine motor skills, visual motor and perceptional skills, physical strengthening, overall conditioning, enhanced sensory processing. At Motor Planet, they strive to help your children grow. If you'd like to learn more on how this fantastic app works, there is a one week free trial and that is courtesy of Motor Planet. So if you wanna grab that on your Android or Apple device, visit them online today. It's motorplanet.com. That's M-O-T-O-R-P-L-A-N-I-T.com. All right, folks, and welcome back. Okay, well, I hope you're rested up in that break because I am welcoming on my friend, Brian. Brian Clayton to the uh, Bulletproof Marketer. Brian is the CEO and co-founder of GreenPal, which is an organic marketplace that connects homeowners with lawn care professionals. GreenPal has been called the Uber, the Uber for lawn care. Have you thought about that, folks? No, you're just hearing it for the first time? Well, you're hearing it from me. By Entrepreneur Magazine, it has over 200,000 active users completing thousands of transactions per day. Holy shit, okay, that's a lot. Um, before starting GreenPal, Brian founded uh, Peachtree Inc., which was one of the largest landscaping companies in the state of Tennessee, growing to into over 10 million a year in annual revenue before it was acquired by Lucid Holdings in 2013. Um, so excited to have Brian today. Brian, welcome to the Bulletproof Marketer. Christopher, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, no problem, man. Um, so I, I, I've given you um, your illustrious nutshell reading. Um, what, what, what else can you add to that list of something that people uh, don't know about you? Yeah, I might be one of the only guys uh, in, 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 in the world that has gone from blue collar as it gets entrepreneur to tech entrepreneur. Like literally, like I had a landscaping company where we had 90 trucks going out every day and Literally at night, I would work on lawnmowers and sharpen lawnmower blades. And I gave all of that up and sold that business. And after I took some time off, I started a tech company and had to learn how to write software. So I'm probably the only guy that can change a transmission in a Ford F-250 and can also fix a JavaScript bug on your website. It's That's a unique thing about me. So, so the unique thing about you is you're a modern day Renaissance man. Uh, so <laughs> with that said, so, okay, let's, 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 I like this. This is a good starting point for our conversation. You know, um, obviously we want to talk about local organic SEO. I kind of buried the lead there, folks. I didn't say that at the head of the segment, um, but uh, Brian has some really great insights I want to share about local organic SEO, like I mentioned earlier um, in the show. Um, but you talked about going from blue collar to um, tech entrepreneur. How did you make that? I don't want to say switch. It's more of like a transition, right? How did you make that transition from blue collar to tech? Yeah, it was an evolution. Uh, it took about okay. three years. And the only thing that kept me going was our customers kept telling us they wanted our product and they wanted our product to work and our product didn't work. And I, I always tried to outsource this stuff. And every time I tried to outsource it, it was always a disaster. So I was just like, screw it. I'll just learn it myself. And I took every online course I could take to learn how to code. My, my co-founder went to a software boot camp and we learned how to, how to build software. We could not figure out a way to pay a dev shop to get to where we wanted to go. We had to really do it ourselves. And looking back, it's kind of like opening a restaurant, but with no chef. You know, it's kind of how silly it is. You know, if you think you're going to start a tech startup and you don't know how to write, it, write software. So we just had to learn it ourselves. 
And that's the way to go. I mean, it's it. it I, I love hearing that because I've talked to other people that have done the same thing where it's kind of like you're always told to outsource, right? If you want to grow, outsource. Outsource anything that you can't do. Don't learn something that you don't know how to do. And I find lots of value there because I think that if you're able to bring that value inside of your own company, you're kind of like you can manifest your own destiny as opposed to waiting for, I mean, because there's nothing worse than bugging the shit out of somebody that doesn't want to talk to you, um, <laughs> especially with every time that you talk to them. It's like, hey, how you doing? This is broken. This is broken. And this isn't working. And I have right. five complaints that I have to deal with, Right. Um, which I'm sure kind of uh, was one of the biggest pushes for you. <laughs> Um, it's just, uh, it's just, you know, it's like delegation and outsourcing is great if you know how to do the shit. If, if you're trying to outsource something that you don't have the first idea how it works, that's a recipe for disaster. And so we had to learn that the hard way. It took, took, took three, three years. Yeah, but, but, a, but a good investment of time for your future. I mean, especially seeing where you've grown, right? Um, so so when, you were, when you were going from like Peachtree to Green Pal, was that going from kind of, was, was Peachtree the first step into the blue collar to tech? Yeah, yeah. Peachtree Landscaping was, a, at, 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 towards the end of it, 150 employees, $10 million a year, 90 trucks going out every day, big landscaping company that I built from just me and a push mower. It took me 15 years to build this business from just me and a push mower to like one of the largest landscaping businesses in the state of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Sold that business and I took like a year off and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I kind of like half-ass retired. And I thought, well, an app needs to exist for what I just spent the last 15 years of my life doing. Somebody should just be able to push a button and get a grass cutting service. Why, why can't I build that? I, you know, I'm going to try to build that. Why can't it be me? Because somebody's going to build it. And it was kind of naivete as an asset. I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know how challenging it was going to be. But that was a good thing. And I recruited two co-founders and, and we like I mentioned, paid a de development shop to build what we thought the app should be and do. And it was a total failure, yeah. but we got a handful of customers and we learned from them and just kept grinding on it over and over and over again. And, and now we're a, a 10 year overnight success. We have over 300,000 people using the app, doing close to $30 million a year in revenue and self-funded. We've self-funded the business the whole way through. We haven't raised any outside capital. I love that too. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that myself. I'm, that's how I built our agency. And um, I really respect that way of growing. Now, one question I have for you there is, um, of course, like I, I, when you're when you're trying to diverse, like kind of find your point of differentiation in terms of you know, because at the time, I'm sure when you were developing Peachtree, there was still Angie's list, there still was Craigslist, there's still those other services that were putting like millions of dollars behind advertising. How did you get heard in that yeah. audience with all that noise? It's really tough. Uh, to your point, the first thing is you have to be the best in the world at something. You have to have a solution to somebody's problem. Right. And, and if you need a lawn mowing service, it's actually really difficult to get a good lawn mowing service. Yes, there's Angie's List, Yelp, Facebook, Craigslist. These are static repositories of names and phone numbers. And you still have to poll these people, call them, leave voicemails, negotiate price, hire them, hope they show up and then work out the payment. GreenPal was and is the only end-to-end -end solution where you come on as a homeowner, you pop your address in, you get quotes very quickly, you hire the person you want to work with, they come out, take care of the service, and you pay them right through the app. You go from like nothing to done in, in, in minutes. And so we were focusing on one use case, one chore, one vertical, one industry, and, and not worrying about anything else. And so that's how we diversified and like differentiated our, ourselves from our competitors and, and, de and delivered a 10 X experience now, but how do you cut through the noise? You know, how do you, yeah. how do you get the word out about something when, you know, you're up against multi-million dollar ad budgets and, and like, er you know, everybody's tried those things and they didn't work. So then they think, well, how, how's your thing going to be any better? It was just sheer focus. We just really dialed it down to, okay, we're, we're, we're based out of Nashville, Tennessee. Let's just make it work in Nashville, Tennessee, and not even just Nashville, like, East Nashville, like one little corner of Nashville. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's hustle up 20 contractors and try to hustle up a few hundred homeowners and see if we can make this thing work. Because if we can make it work in this little corner of the, of the world, we can make it work anywhere. And that's how we approached it. And we spent four years just in Nashville, Tennessee, 
expanding, figuring out how to make the product work better, faster, smoother, cheaper, more reliable, listening to all of the feedback from our customers daily, telling us everywhere we, we let them down and, and how to make it better. And then also figuring out our marketing strategy, figuring out, okay, how are we going to get more customers? And we tested every sort of digital marketing channel under the sun and eventually landed on, on local organic SEO as the thing that we could just bet the company on, so to speak, and repeat throughout the country and, and get good sustainable ROI based on the efforts we put into it. But at first it was very much an exercise of faith, of faith but that's still how we get over half of our customers. Yeah. And also I think working your ass off doesn't hurt either. And, you know, but I, I think that one of the things you touched on there that's interesting, and I want to kind of circle the conversation over to that was, was you developing the power, uh, you uh, harnessing the power of local organic SEO. So how, kind of what, what tips do you have in that, in, in that, like for someone that else, that else is really trying to target uh, maybe a hyper local audience um, and they're really struggling to connect with them. What, what tips do you have uh, for those people out there? You can compete in, in local SEO just through sheer authenticity and hustle. So the reality is most, most of, the, of, the, of the search results for local queries are the huge big boys that have scaled out and, and stamped out a million landing pages and they're ranking at a local yeah. level. But you can actually compete against those guys through better content, more authentic content, uh, more curated content. At, at a local level because you know the local space better than they do. So, so for example, in our case, you know, let's say we're trying to compete for lawn mowing services in Indianapolis, uh, Indiana, you know, Angie's List, Home Advisor, all of these guys have just like pulled together thousands of names and they and Yelp and they spit it back out and hope it ranks. Whereas we know these contractors, we know the top 10 contractors in Indianapolis. We work with them. We know their backstory. We interview them. We, we talk about what makes their little business better than other contractors in Indianapolis. We, we talk about what kind of equipment they have, where, where they went to school, uh, what, why they got in the landscaping business. What is it that they, uh, what, you know, what parts of, of Indianapolis do they serve? What neighborhoods, like down to the neighborhood level? Uh, you know, what, what, uh, what is it about the landscaping business that they like and what is it that they don't like? Literally all of these nuances we take the time to handcraft the best content about the top 10 best landscaping contractors in Indianapolis. And then we surface that material to Google. People like that content better. It solves their problem better. And therefore that's how we outcompete some of the big guys. And so if you're, you're really willing to take like, like do, th do, do the hard things, do the things that don't scale, and figure out a way to make it move a little quicker and, and, and pick up the velocity on it. That's how you approach it. Whereas most people get, you know, they get uh, discouraged with, with search because they try to compete and play the same game that, that guys that have been around 20 years are playing and you're not playing that game. You got, you got to approach it differently. Absolutely. And I, and I think that it's it, one of the things that you said that I just like to highlight is that you said that, you know, you don't always have to, there is meaning in some of the things that you do that do not scale your company. There's meaning in, in those, in those areas. And I think those pockets are what really give credibility to your mission and credibility to your business. And I think people, um, I, I see it all the time, right? Because yep. I'm working with, um, I'm working with uh, an integrated digital marketing campaigns for clients from lots of different industries. And you try to let them know that, you know, this, this, this is meaningful, but this is not going to make you money. Right. And they were like, well, take that out. We, we, yeah. we're on return. And yeah. I'm just like, sweetie, no, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, we got to like try to get something else going on here, but um, okay. So um, interesting. Okay. So one other thing I wanted to kind of ask you is in, in getting these, these top 10 guys or gals and uh, landscapers, let's say that's, that's safer. So top 10 landscapers, how are you choosing them from within your app? Like what is qualifying these individuals that, that to make them top 10? Yeah, in the early days, it was hand-to-hand -hand combat. I, I knew the first, personally knew the first 1,000 contractors that used our platform. They all had my mm. cell number. And so it was very much hand outreach, calling them off of Craigslist, calling them off of Facebook, Yelp, whatever, and pitching them on the idea of using GreenPal. Now we have over 32,000 lawn care services that use the app to run their business. 
And so now it's, it's much more an automated uh, way that we understand who's good, who's not, who's reliable, who's not. And so we, we, because we are in the middle of the transaction, we measure how often do they show up on time? If they're supposed to be there on Thursday, do they show up on Thursday and complete the job on Thursday? And if they do, they're scored positively. If they don't, they're scored negatively. And that, that's a very simple thing that we understand that nobody else does, you know, how reliable these contractors are. Nobody else, Yelp doesn't understand, Facebook doesn't know, Craigslist doesn't know how reliable these contractors are. We do because we score that. We also score how often they, they get hired for a second service. And we use that as a indication of, was the homeowner pleased with their service? Because if they are, they're going to book them for the whole season. Just set it and forget it. That's, that's the value that our app adds. But if this contractor in particular is only getting booked again, like 10% of the time, they're probably not doing a very good job. So we downgrade them. We understand that they're not, they're not very reliable and they're not doing a very good quality job. And then we also have the, the traditional five-star qualitative feedback system that everybody's accustomed to. Um, but what, where we really begin to understand who's reliable, who's not, is through the passive signals of the activity that's occurring through the platform. We're able to gauge that and use that to, to surface the reliable contractors and allow homeowners to kind of hire them off the shelf, so to speak. And also demote and even sometimes uh, expel the unreliable contractors who just aren't any good, who aren't doing a good job, who don't really aren't putting their soul into this business. That's really interesting. Um, so, okay, well, well, Brian, it's been uh, it's been really fantastic talking to you. Um, I, I I just I love your approach to how you've kind of gone from blue collar to tech, and then how you've taken everything that you've learned and continually to grow and just build something that's really, it's quite dynamic. Um, so uh, where can people learn more about you and also GreenPal? Yeah, you know, life's too short to mow your own yard. So just download GreenPal in the App Store or Play Store. Uh, anybody wants to hit me up, you can hit me up at Instagram, Brian M. Clayton. Just drop me a DM there, I'll hit you back. Okay, excellent. And also we'll put, we'll put your links in the um, show notes as well, Brian. Um, but thank you so much for joining me today on the Bulletproof Marketer. Christopher, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Um, cats and kittens. I'm going to steal a basket line there. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll be back after the break. All right. See you in a minute. All right. I have a pretty picky pet. Our golden doodle ah, olive is leaning yes. pretty heavy on the poodle steak, side and it's pretty picky about give me a lobster. I'm going to throw you know, the steak that out is the window until she tried to square their hands like a okay. caveman. Before she tried to square pet, we've given her like anyway, different types of food. Um, then, it, but we've being left, a seafood we've freak, try it out for I was while. familiar with the brand Cousins Main Lobster when I saw them on Shark Tank because I like watching that just to judge everybody that's on the show. You know how it goes. And so little did I know that which is they great opened because a location a just around the corner. Well, I tried out their food, their lobster rolls. All the lobster comes the from Maine. It's unbelievable. They have a ton of different things on their menu. Dogs the best part cats, about you know, Cousins, there's three different ways that you can get you can get in touch with this good food. As well as you can find a truck. They do their food trucks. I'm so they have restaurants. And also, they will actually ship so you main lobster like is, folks, okay my amazon order came in and then there's a lobster on top of it i mean who can say no to that again, i mean i wouldn't like i kind of love it anyway you need to find out more about them go to cousinsmainlobster.com um cousins main lobster.com that's main meaning that the lobster is coming from maine Oh, so that's Maine with an E, folks. Um, check them out. You have to, I mean, honestly, look through their pictures of their food and you're going to order something immediately. So check out Cousins Maine Lobster, my choice for seafood, folks. Awesome. Welcome back, folks. So that interview with Brian was phenomenal. Uh, I hope that you, uh, I mean, it's really inspiring, right? You know, he was, he, he saw that he was not getting what he wanted. And he had a vision in his mind about where he wanted to go. And he just learned how to do it himself. You know, that is really, really killer for me because um, like I said in the interview, we're always told that just look for people that are smarter than you and then you can rely on them. And the, and the, and the honest answer is that you always can't. And in this case, Brian learned that you couldn't. And he just went above and beyond to create his own journey and path. So Hats off to Brian. I really, I really was inspired by his story. Um, but now we're going to go into another one of our segments, which is the BPM tra 
Spotter. Nope, we didn't trend Spotter. What the hell am I talking about? We're doing Stockholm Syndrome. All right, folks. You know something. You are crazy. You just think you are. <laughs> what I'm talking about here is marketers Stockholm Syndrome, where we go so far into our heads that we can't see reality, much less what's about like five feet in front of us. So this is where I can help you as one marketer to another marketer, you, and I can help you go from what am I doing wrong to feeling empowered. So I'm here for you. And today's topic is going to be short form videos. <laughs> okay. What do we think about short form videos? Of course, what you're all thinking is, how the hell do I do them? I don't know how to do, I don't know how to shoot videos. Do I have to hire somebody? Should I get an intern to do them? Um, what, if, what if I can get some videos on Fiverr? Okay. Honey, you're spinning out of control. Let's let's calm down. <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. Um, and the reason why I can say that and not be condescending is because I've been there. You know, when video has been touted as the next big thing for a long time and every marketer out there goes, yeah, 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 video, video, video. Yeah, but the thing is that our clients or our organizations that we work with and don't understand that. They see video as expensive thinking that every single movie that we make is going to be have a, a budget of the Titanic, um, involve um, like lighting people, might and makeup people. We're going to have to cast extras that are going to be milling about in the background. I mean, it, it, it's, it's absolutely crazy. Well, this isn't the 90s um, or even the noughties. This is the now. And now video is very, very easy to actually do yourself and we're not we're not asking for these really slick beautiful videos we're asking for real honest video now of course you can't have your thumb you have someone that um holds things that like uh, with a shaky with a shaky hand while their fingers over the um the the camera lens but you can do things very sophisticated um in a very sophisticated manner rather with equipment that you have such as a phone and a natural light source it, there's there's things that you can do that are very very good. Um, you can do interviews. You can do um, testimonials. You can do um, just off the cuff TikTok videos. But the thing is this: it's thinking about what you actually need to execute something like this. Now, user generated content is something that I talk about a lot, and you know people get confused about it, thinking that okay, we have to pay these people to do that. You can. Or maybe some people just love your product or service enough that they will do something un, 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 unrewarded, I guess. And there, there is a lot of value to that and having other people help you with your creative. But why don't you get a longer video that you have that you're comfortable with and maybe chop it down to a Reels length or a TikTok length or something of that sort, because that's gonna provide you some opportunities to see how you can edit video that makes sense. And it will make sense and it will kind of benefit your audience. The thing is that I want you all to know that there is no golden ticket in terms of what short form video is and how you will get there. Every company has its own journey to go on because it's, it's less of, I could say, Get your put an hour aside a day, um, pick a couple subject matters or things to talk about, and talk directly to camera and film yourself. And then, um, when you put it up on um, TikTok or Reels, edit it to have some voiceover, some music, or some or whatever stickers or pull whatever, and add it in there. Um, but then you also have to appease your clients. You have to appease the organization. So I can't do that. You have to build something that works for your clients so you can pitch it to them and also for your actual organization. So I think it's really taking an, a content that you have already and seeing how you can cut it down yourself using like any editing program that you have. Uh, so anything that's very basic and find a basic editor online and just kind of tool around with it a little bit. The thing is that you need to get your feet wet right now. You don't necessarily have to go and do a video course. That's not necessarily what you have to do. I would suggest going to see who your direct competitors are and seeing what they're doing with video. If they're not doing anything, you are in the same boat as them. But I'm not to, not to say that you wake up on Monday morning and you get an alert that one of your competitors is now on TikTok and posting 40 videos. And if you think that TikTok is going to be for children and dancing and, and humor, 
for its entire existence, you're sadly mistaken. This is where it starts, folks. It's going to evolve and there's going to be opportunities there. So that's where you need to pay attention to as well. It's, it's kind of, you know, you don't want to be a dinosaur when it comes to video. You need to be current. Now, I'm not saying if you're a law firm and you are an elder law firm, which is very serious, um, you're doing funny dance videos all the time. I don't think that's necessarily what it needs to break the algorithm. You just need to have good content that your audience is going to enjoy and, it, and to create a community off the back of that. So I say all of this to let you know that you are not alone. Video content is a struggle for all marketers. There's no marketers out there like, yeah, it's easy. Oh, yeah. And if they do say that, they have one lane or one road of that journey completed and down. The rest of it's a, a mystery to them. So just know that you need to work that muscle and you need to get better at it, but not everyone's great at it. It takes time. I didn't just wake up one day and say, okay, how am I going to create video out of nothing? I had to work at it. You had to figure out things. I had to look at workarounds and then I had to constantly evolve as those workarounds changed. So you have to be the same, you have to be malleable, but don't get down on yourself that video is something that you can't do. You can do it. You just need enough room and, and oxygen in the room for you to breathe and have that moment to actually discover how to do it the best. Again, look for other people to influence you and look for other people to give you ideas on what is best and then kind of copy them, try them, see, see if it works for you. Does it feel natural? Does it work? You know what I mean? Give it, like before I would pitch anything to a boss, I would give him exactly some samples of what I would want to have on the channel and how I envision doing it. And why would I do that? Because I wouldn't be conceptualizing through mood boards. I would be giving him something actual that I had to do. So you've already gone through the process of how it would be created. So if he says yes, or she says yes, guess what? You're good to go. You know how to do it. You're off to the off and, off and running quickly. So Video is very important. Just don't get in your feelings about it. You just need to kind of keep pushing that rock up the hill. Now we're going to be changing gears because after the break, I have Harry Morton from Lower Street and we are going to be talking about some podcasting. So podcasters or future podcasters out there, join me after the break. Okay, so skincare is Definitely something that's really important to me, but at the same time, I don't have a lot of time. So I really want the most bang for my buck and something that is very, very fast and efficient. And that's when I found Truly Clear. Now, when I found Truly Clear, it's a really great product that actually helps acne. So if you have, um, if you have a child that has acne or you have adult acne, whatever, just want clean face. I just love the product because why? Because it's, it's smarter, faster, and better. It calms your skin, it stops acne, and it heals your skin. So it does the full range of nourishment on your skin. I mean, simply put, Truly Clear stops acne, clears blackheads and whiteheads quickly. You can use it anywhere you have acne, just one or two times daily or less for less than five minutes. That's the best part, less than five minutes for long lasting results. So if you have acne that you wanna clear up or you just wanna have beautiful glowing skin like the Bulletproof Marketer, then you got to check out Truly Clear. Visit them online. It's trulyclear.com. T-R-U-L-Y-C-L-E-A-R.com. Again, trulyclear.com. Fast, smart, just better. Okay, folks, and we're back. Uh, thanks so much for joining us again after the break. I have a really fantastic guest for you because you would, I don't know if you'd be shocked or not, but like so many different people in our audience are, are tweeting me and dropping it, slipping into my DMs deep and asking me about podcasting. Uh, and I wanted to find another expert for you because we've brought some people on in the past. And um, Harry Morton from Lower Street is someone that I was really excited to bring you um, just to ask, um, ask him some questions to kind of pick his brain as to um, kind of how you can get more engaged with podcasting. Um, just so you know, just a little bit about um, Harry and Lower Street. Harry is the founder and head podcast strategy at Lower Street. Um, and they are a full service podcast production agency that creates amazing shows for brands that want great, not good, which I love. 
Uh, they serve companies of all sizes across lots of different industries, and they help them developing podcasts that are unique to each company's target audience, which sounds spot on for what we're going to be talking about today. So, um, Harry, uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us on the Bulletproof Marketer. Thanks so much for having me. Pleasure. Yeah, no, no, no problem at all. So, <clears throat> Harry, what else can you say? What else, what else do people need to know about you? After my illustrious intro for you. You, know, you did a fantastic job. Thank you. It was far too generous, honestly. Uh, no, we produce, um, exactly as you mentioned, podcasts of, of, of all kinds for, for brands from um, small uh, agencies all the way up to large enterprise companies. Um, and I think what we're really focused on is, is in the sea of podcasts that is appearing before us, you know, as everyone is launching a podcast over the last two years, um, how are brands making something that cuts through that noise? And I think that's what we're really focused on. In, and, and the thing that we drill into that I think helps us to, to, help, to, to allow podcasts to stand apart is really driving into narrative and storytelling and trying to do more. Uh, Cause I think a lot of what folks lean on is just straightforward interview based shows, which are awesome. But I think that um, there's a lot of opportunity for us to go one step further and try and create something uh, a little, a little deeper that will, um, you know, definitely allow us to, to sort of, stand out from the from the crowd i completely agree with that um i i really do think that the narrative pulls people in mm. um straight interviews are, are are great i mean we're having one now but the, yeah. it's kind of uh what else goes around that um what other what other things need to what other buttons need to be pushed now when it, when it came to podcasting harry i'm interested kind of what how did you get involved kind of what how did it, how did you come to podcasting Absolutely. Well, so my background's in audio post-production. So I worked um, when I first graduated in, in doing sort of um, TV ad campaigns with, with large national, international brands. Um, but then from various uh, career moves, as we do, I worked in sales for many years. Um, and during that period, was very keen to sort of start my own thing um, and was spent all of that time listening to podcasts to educate myself on how to make that move from sales into sort of business um, and entrepreneurship and uh, and the penny dropped probably a little slower than it should have done um, but uh, hey why not you know I'm, I'm deeply involved in podcasting I've got a background in audio and the business and so I sort of brought them full circle to to start Lower Street we did that five years ago or six years ago now and um, uh, and we've been growing pretty rapidly because we're in a space where there's just there's a lot of interest and i think more and more brands are looking for that sort of authentic connection with audiences the ability to tell stories rather than just um you know put out content for the sake of content i think folks want to connect with with humans um and hear real stories and so um yeah it's been an exciting space and it's developing it all the time and i think that's kind of the, I, get, I mean i can i can kind of mirror that trend in, in what I'm seeing in terms of people that um, my prospects or my clients that are coming to me and they're exploring new options because they're looking for as as everybody kind of focuses on more authentic communication and more authentic interaction with brands um, this podcasting is one of the most fabulous ways I think to really get your voice and your emotion and it and not emotion like I'm going to make you cry I'm going to make you scream I'm going to make you horrified but just to kind of evoke any sort of relationship and kind of poke and prod. And, um, and it's also a fantastic additional channel for content that you're already produce, um, producing. So it's, um, it's a natural extension. And I think that um, I've been really, really touting it as the next big thing for a while. So I love when I have, I can just shut up and go, ah, I was right. Okay, excellent. Everyone can reap the benefits now. Um, and let's move on to the next thing, which is the metaverse. We won't talk about that. Um, <laughs> Because no one knows what the hell it is. Anyway, <clears throat> so uh, I digress. I'm going to ask some questions that I think are frequently asked um, from, um, I want to say peers, but marketing peers um, when it comes to a podcast. Obviously, why should you start a podcast? I think if you're, if we're, if we're listening right now, we know it's important. So now that we, we've decided to do it, now we're thinking about time and expense, right? That's the next big thing. That's the next big question. How often should you podcast? Is there a magic number? Absolutely. I think this is a really important question and one that um, I, I get asked a lot, but I think a lot of people come with preconceptions that, uh, that maybe um, we can try and steer them away from those pitfalls. Um, so what we like to say in podcasting a lot is that it really rewards consistency. It's so important to have a regular touch point with your audience in order to gain some momentum, build that audience and get the engagement you're looking for. Um, 
because podcasting is not a viral medium. It's very much driven by word of mouth. So people literally, the most common way they discover shows is because they were referred to it by a friend or a, a colleague, family member, something like that. So what that means is that we really want to sort of rely on, on regularity to, to sort of create a habit in our listeners um, uh, listening so that we can kind of reach them on a regular basis and grow that audience. Um, what we typically very commonly hear from brands is that, you know, our CEO is going to be the host of this show and they're far too busy. We can't do that every week. We want to go monthly. And I totally understand that, you know, the C-suite, every, whoever's involved, anyone within the organization, marketers are the busiest people I, I know. Um, that, but if we do it on that monthly cadence, we fall into the trap of basically people forget the show exists between episodes. And so it's really, really hard to get the impact that we're looking for, get that audience that we're looking for. So instead, what I like to, so, I mean, the ideal thing is a weekly show that um, similar to, to what we're doing right here. This is a show that goes out every week and that's um, a really regular thing. And that puts it in a great position to grow. If we're not able to do that, um, we say, well, great, let's take those 12 monthly episodes that we would have done this year and condense that into a 12 episode season that will run over the space of a quarter. So it means that we can kind of plan for that content. We can record it in advance so that we're able to space out the timings between the kind of commitments needed from the, the various people to make that happen. But instead of dripping that out over a year where it'll be very, very hard to see meaningful impact, instead we can get that in, in a really condensed period of time, um, get much more feedback from the audience, have much more to talk about and shout about in terms of PR and marketing of this, this content. Um, and then have a really great opportunity to review, hey, did this work? Is this something we want to go and do it again for another season and, and, and all that sort of stuff? So um, there is no one right answer. It's different for every brand, and it really depends on your goals and what you're trying to achieve. But um, definitely kind of weekly is ideal, and then seasonal is, is a really great kind of approach if folks are super busy. So I'd like to just to kind of like to highlight the seasonal approach because it's not something that I believe a lot of people keep to the forefront of their minds or really even understand fully. Um, I, I've talked to people about this before the, the, to create a season. And it's really wonderful if you don't understand how you're going to get guests or how you're going to do, uh, how you're going to source all this different information. You could literally be, base a whole season off of an ebook or off of a report that you've created and break each one of those sections down to different episodes where you talk about that. And then you already have all of your content. You just might need to have to beef it up or finesse it a little bit. But it's another way to have audio, an audio component which you can share the link and it just immediately bumps you up in terms of credibility. Absolutely. Um, that, that's a, a really fantastic thing to do. I am obviously a massive um, uh, kind of podcast first advocate. So I, you know, you know, pinch of salt, right? I might be biased, but, um, but if you, we love it. If you create the content first in, in audio, um, you know, utilizing interviews or whatever else you want to do, and then repurpose that into all of these other forms of content as well. Um, you know, both have their merits. I'm not uh, suggesting one that's necessarily better than the other, but podcasting is a really repurposable, if that's even a word, uh, medium. You know, it gives you a great opportunity to reuse lots. And right now you and I are shooting on video, right? And, and I think this podcast goes out in just audio, but mm -hmm. then you have this extra resource that maybe you can create some extra social content with or, or whatever. So um, it's a, it's a great, um, it's a great piece of content to be able to, to use in many different ways. Okay, so, so now that we talked about kind of like the consistency that we should be kind of shooting for, um, how long, what is like, what is an optimal length for sure. a podcast? Well, one of the things that, uh, one of the lines that I love um, is that a, a podcast should be as long as it needs to be and not a minute longer, um, <laughs> which basically means, I think it's very tempting to sort of have long form conversations and allow those to go on um for as long as they go on for you know i'm thinking of joe rogan for example where you might be sitting there for two and a half hours listening to an interview with elon musk or whoever it might be um that's wonderful and it has its place but i think for the most part particularly when we're talking about branded b2b content generally speaking the folks we're trying to reach are not interested in listening for two hours they want to get get what they need and, and get out kind of thing um and so yeah again it's kind of an annoying answer in that it so depends right what's the brand what's the what are the goals who are we trying to reach all these kind of things will impact decisions like this but what i would say is that wherever possible we want to lean on making it as tight and concise as possible rather than letting it kind of ramble um often the the sort of sweet spot that we arrive at is somewhere between 25 and 40 minutes worth of content but really depends on like 
what style of show we're trying to produce. You know, similarly, we work on some shows that are, you know, five minute daily podcasts and then other ones that are sort of, you know, much more in depth, longer form things. So it, it, it very much um, depends. That's just a really, I'm just, I, just something I think that's, and that's interesting that a lot of people fall in the trappings of when they, when businesses are putting together the podcast, they're thinking, okay, we're gonna do a 45 minute podcast. Um, we're gonna have two guests and then that's gonna be the format. And then what happens is they end up having 40 minutes of content instead of 45. And then they are, oh my God, we have to find five more minutes. Do they need to, or is it okay to vary the length of your podcast? Totally cool to vary the length of the podcast. I think we need to think, we need to think there's, there's a step, like I said, consistency is rewarded, right? So we want to right. know as a listener to a show, what am I signing up for? If I click the subscribe button, what am I going to get in the future? So we don't want to have a situation where it's going to be five minutes today and two hours the next, because then they're like, well, how do I fit this into my life? Like, I don't know what to expect. But if one day it's 30 minutes and the next day it's 45, like that's, you know, that's a, a, a not too crazy assumption that that might fit into the same sort of part of your day that you would spend listening to that content. Um, so I think, you know, within reason, you have, a per, you know, definitely some scope to, to kind of mix things up. Yeah, I just like to, like to throw, like to pepper in things like that because it, it, it's amazing how someone that's never done a podcast becomes extremely structured and very rigid very quickly when they get into it. And I do feel like that rigidity affects the, the quality of the content. Um, so how do you grow? Okay, this is a great question for you, right? Because this is right in your wheelhouse. How do you grow your podcast audience? Absolutely, super common question. I guess, so I've definitely got some strategies. I'm going to share those with you. What I want to preface this with though, is that so often brands come to me and say, and, and, and we talk about what their KPIs are, what, what, how are we going to gauge the success of this podcast? And often they lean into the number of people that have listened. We want X number of thousands of listens to this podcast this season. And that's great. Not saying that that's irrelevant um, because it is definitely relevant. However, the raw number of listens isn't necessarily indicative of the value that the podcast is providing. I think where podcasting really shines is the fact that the engagement level we see is so much higher than other mediums. So um, it's really not uncommon for podcasts that we produce to get 85, 90% completion rates of that entire piece of content. Um, as an average, as compared to what we might see on like video on social, for example, we might be lucky to get five, 10% at a push. Right. So the, the, the engagement rate is so, so much more important. Um, because again, as I said, it's not super viral. So the num the raw number of people listening is going to be lower than we're going to see on a TikTok campaign or whatever. But of the number of people that listened on TikTok, the people that listened on podcasts genuinely care and are truly engaged. So I really encourage folks to think about what does that engagement rate look like first? And if we nail that, by the way, if we get to the 85, 90% mark, the content's going to grow itself because if you're listening to that and you're, you care enough to listen through to the entire thing, you will naturally share that. Um, and so it does become sort of shareable content. Okay. However, that being said, we still want more people listening to our show. Totally reasonable um, kind of desire to have. Um, so I think the, one of the main biggest takeaways, uh, we're talking about kind of 80, 20 principles um, of like, you know, 80, the 20% the of efforts that make 80% of the difference um, is that we want to stay in channel. So as I said, it's not a viral medium. Posting content on social is a really important thing to do, but to get someone to move from scrolling casually through their Instagram feed, hitting the like button and sharing something to then making the leap into their podcast app and spending an hour's worth of time listening to a piece of content is a very hard journey to make. So while it's really important that we do put stuff out on social about our podcast, engage with the community, let them know that this thing exists. So it's on their mind. Um, it's not where we're going to find a source, the main source of our, of our listenership, at least not for 90% of brands um, where they are going to be ready to listen and engage with a long form piece of content is when they're already listening to another podcast. So there's a bunch of people, a bunch of ways that we can reach people um, in that mode. The first one is just on other podcasts. So for example, you and I having this conversation, if I was to tomorrow to start up another marketing podcast, I could say, Hey, you know, I'm really enjoying this conversation. If you, the listener are enjoying this, come and check out my show because we deal with X, Y, and Z topic. And it's really relevant to this audience for that reason. Um, you have that engaged audience. They already, they're listening to you. They know, like, and trust you now, and they will come and, and sort of join you over on the new podcast. Um, so, uh, and then the other version of that is the sort of pay to play model. So I could go out and sponsor this podcast and say, Hey, could you please shout out my, my show on yours? 
um, and uh, and kind of advertise that uh, the podcast that way. Um, there are also cross promotion partnerships. So if I have my show and you have yours, we can sort of say, hey, let's let's share recommendations to our audiences. So sharing audiences is super important. And by the way, it's not a zero sum game. Folks listen to multiple podcasts every week, and so by you know sharing with your audience another show they should listen to, you're certainly not losing one of yourselves. Um, so that's that. Then, then we'll advertise inside the podcast apps themselves. And there are a bunch of different ways we can do that. There are some that allow you to pay for um, kind of uh, visibility on, on, their, on their apps um, to put your show in front of uh, relevant audiences. And then with, in the case of Apple and Spotify, um, you want to work closely with the editorial teams on those platforms who control the content that is surfaced on the main screens of the apps. Um, uh, and so, you know, that's something that we do a lot um, at Lower Street is kind of pitch our clients shows to Apple. Hey, we've got this story coming up on one of our podcasts. We think it's really relevant for this reason. We'd love it if you could put it on the home screen. And that gets an enormous, you know, uplift in, in traffic that way. Mm. Um, and similarly, in some of the smaller apps like CastBox and Overcast and places like that, you can pay for that access. Great. Um, and uh, and then there are a few other channels that we use, like you know, programmatic advertising is is another one with some um, specific partnerships. But uh, but I think for most part, for the everyday podcaster, I think cross promotions, partnerships with other podcasters, going out and being a guest on other podcasts to promote your show, um, and then working with those editorial teams, those are like the biggest levers um, for most shows. There's obviously a million things that we can be doing, but I think those are some of the biggest. Okay, well, I have one more, one more question for you before you go, Harry. Um, you know, if you could give one piece of advice to someone who is podcasting currently, mm. um, what would it be to kind of enhance their game or level themselves up? Yeah, I think what I would say is, this is such an easy thing to say, but not necessarily an easy thing to do, is to just have a laser focus on your listener. I think so many times the pitfall that we see brands making in particular is they they come up with a concept for a show we've got this great idea we're going to interview these folks about this thing and it's going to be an amazing show they then find themselves in a position where they're having to then go out into the world and find listeners for this thing that they've created mm. what we spend all of our time doing is okay who do we tr who do we want to reach why are we having this podcast in the first right. place who are they and what do they want and let's make that because right now there's no shortage of shows for them to listen to we need to make sure that it's something that they genuinely want so even if you have a podcast that's already out there, I would think really, really carefully around who you're trying to reach, what other shows are in their periphery that they could be listening to over yours, and how does yours truly deliver on the things that they need, and how is it different and unique? Um, and so I think there are a million growth hacks we can think of with podcasting, growing that audience, but really it comes down to the quality and the relevance of your content. So just taking a load of time to kind of think about, about that. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I this is what I'm telling my clients every freaking day um, in terms of their content. You know, it's kind of, you can come up, I can come up with the perfect target audience for you, but if you're just going to shove your old, stale, dusty marketing message down their throats, they're going to choke on it. So, you you know, understand what they're doing, understand. And the best part is, is that a lot of the times with what you were saying, like um, featuring yourself in other podcasts and looking for other opportunities, um, I, I will be asked the question, well, how do I know what shows are right for me? You don't know what people are listening to in your audience. I mean, especially if you're a service-based or a specific um, uh, in a niche company, um, it, it is kind of easy to see where your audience is going to be. Um, but I do think that I agree with you 100%, Harry. I think it's really just making sure that your message is really laser focused to your audience. Um, and not necessarily you're pandering to them, but you're, you're cultivating information that they're going to want to engage with um, because you want them to listen to your full show. <laughs> you don't want them to listen to five minutes and go, I'm not get me the hell out of here. That's um, so the point. That's so the point. You want to make something that they listen to the first five minutes. They go, wow, this is worth the next 40 minutes of my life, you know, um, mm -hmm. and you're not going to do that with something that you kind of, that, that you think is interesting. You need to make sure that this is what these folks care about. Absolutely, precisely. Harry, thank you so much for joining us on the Bulletproof Marketer. Where can people learn more about yourself on Lower Street? Thanks so much. It's been uh, really fun. Um, uh, I'm, I hang out on Twitter a lot. I'm at Podcast Harry on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> and the work that we do, you can find at lowerstreet.co. Um, would love to chat with anyone that wants to nerd out about podcasting. Yeah, and uh, as with all of our guests, we have all of the information and links um, to their profiles in the bio, in the show notes. So check those out and connect with Harry and Lower Street. Harry, again, thanks so much for joining us today on the Bulletproof Marketer. Thank you. 
All right, folks, uh, we are going to be back after the break, and we're going to be talking about Stockholm Syndrome and why you as marketers are suffering from it. Is it something new? It's a segment every week, folks. Get used to it. Okay, I'll see you after the break. All right, I have a pretty picky pet. Our golden doodle, Olive, is leaning pretty heavy on the poodle side and is pretty picky about her food. You know, that is until she tried Square Pet. Okay, before she tried Square Pet, we've given her like 14 different types of food. And but we've let, we've let her try it out for a while. We're not changing them every day. Don't, don't be a hater. But uh, we gave her a Square Pet and she gobbled it up and is totally eating only that now, which is great because it's a healthy, all natural pet nutrition that's been developed by veterinary professionals using only the highest quality and responsibly sourced ingredients. There are solutions for both dogs and cats. You know, I, I'm, I'm not biased. Dogs or cats, everyone's welcome. As well as specialized diets that are backed by science. I'm so overprotective of Olive and I want to treat her like a queen. So Square Pets, it is folks. Learn more and order a bag to try out today at mysquarepet.com. Again, mysquarepet.com. Woof. Okay, folks, we're back. Uh, great talk with Harry. Um, you know, if you haven't been interested in podcasting before, you know, every time that we talk about it here on the show, even I get a little bit more excited about, um, you know, kind of finding new ways of making our own show more interesting and more engaging and, and, um, and kind of going out and being guests on other, uh, other shows. So thanks again to Harry. It was a, that was a great interview. So this leads us to um, one of my favorite segments and one of the shortest segments of the show, which everyone will love. Uh, which is the silver bullet. So each week I want to dive into a topic that is a silver bullet or it's a secret technique to reach and attain your marketing goal, goals. So this week, oh, this is going to be a shocker. This is going to be controversial. Um, the uh, silver bullet for this week, it's podcasting. <laughs> we just talked to Harry about this and there is nothing that rings more true than having social audio incorporated into your overall strategy. Why am I going to get rich off of podcasting? If I do podcasts every single week for an hour, is that going to give me the ROI that I need? Oh, Jesus, if this, if this is the way that you're thinking about it, don't do podcasting ever. Just, just go ahead and sit in the corner and just count your money and hope for a return and look for that ROI in every single thing that you do because sometimes ROI becomes return on influence, not return on investment. If you're looking for podcasts to deliver dollar to dollar within the first show that you do, rub a lamp, unless you are a celebrity and even celebrity shows tank. So here's the thing, social audio is going to be very, very important. Utilizing voice is going to be more and more important as we move forward through this digital age as we kind of progress. So if that's the case, podcasting is a really easy, straightforward way of executing that social audio. And I say easy because it's conversational. It's not trying to use a crazy platform that no one's ever used before. It's a Zoom call without video, folks. I mean, if you, you can make shows pretty, pretty much out of that. So it can be very straightforward and very, very, uh, it's a great way for you to extend your own content. But listen, social audio is going to be really important. And podcasts is a great first step to throw your hat in the ring and get prepared for that future. All right. So look into it. It's not painful to start it. Just try it out. I mean, even if you have a show that you don't promote, just to see if you kind of like the sound of your own voice or what you would want to say or change things up. Just try it out a little bit because, uh, you know, it's really important to be positioning yourself as an expert and also looking credible. And audio really helps you engage in a really rich way, much like video does. Video really engages people. Audio does the same thing. So please do not sleep on that. Um, your silver bullet is podcasting. All right, folks. And after the break, we're going to do a quick little wrap up. See you in a minute. So when any of my clients ask me, hey, do you guys do PR? I always say, no, I hate it. I dislike the media and dealing with them. 
Well, that's pretty true. So uh, obviously I don't want to leave anybody high and dry. So the number one person that I recommend is my good friend, April Margulies. April is the CEO and founder of Trust Relations, a national PR firm that totally kicks ass. Why do I know that they kick ass? Because they've gotten me into many, many national magazines and they've helped many of the referrals that I've sent over to them get some really phenomenal national acclaim. And they could do the same thing for you. So if you were looking for some PR coverage for your company, your brand, or just yourself as a thought leader, I really suggest that you go and visit them. You can go to trustrelations.agency. Again, that's trustrelations.agency. Ask for April and tell them the Bulletproof Marketer sent you. All right, all right, all right. We're back. So it is time for us to do our recap. So what a show it was. We learned that uh, TikTok is going to 10 minutes and uh, that's going to be exciting. IGTV is hitting the road, Jack Big style. So what are you going to do with your long form content? Trot your happy ass over to TikTok and throw it up there. Uh, it's welcoming a bit longer content. Why not? Let's migrate that stuff. And then we have LinkedIn that's going to be um, maybe providing some more analytics. Thanks, LinkedIn. Uh, thanks for showing up. Uh, and then we had our fantastic guests, uh, Brian and Harry. Some really great insights, um, entrepreneurial insights from Brian and some podcasting insights from Harry. We went through, hey, don't go crazy, folks. Video is a problem for everyone, all marketers. We're all trying our best at kind of finding the best way to get that done. And also your silver bullet was podcasting. Getting into that social audio game is super duper important. I have to say, folks, I had a great time today on the show. Um, I hope you learned something. You know, it, this is all about uh, you getting some information that you can utilize and hopefully having fun along the way, right? So check us out, uh, gosalesandmarketing.com. Go to our website. You can sign up for our newsletter there. Um, join the brigade of the Bulletproof Marketers. We're all out there for no bullshit marketing advice. Join up, folks. I'll give you something new every single day that's curated straight and ripped from the headlines so you know exactly what's going on. And hey, even better, makes you sound smart in a meeting. <laughs> Grab a story and throw it out at the water cooler. Always works. Anyway, folks, I got to run, be kind, be authentic, and be bulletproof. Until next time.